Thank you, Roberto. Um, so this topic is is a topic that I like very much. Um, the Schottky problem. It's a problem. I think it's it's very beautiful. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is has very little to do. I mean, I'm going to present many results. Um, maybe one of which are mine, I guess. Um, so it's going to be more of a survey. Um, but uh, this is a problem I've been uh, thinking about quite a bit um, recently, and uh, and so it's uh, this is what's been on my mind. So this is what I, I wanted to talk to you about. Okay, so um, the Schottky problem is a it's a very um, it's a very old problem. It's uh, over a hundred years old. So um, well, I'll get into detail about what it's about. Okay, so first I want to start talking about curves and their Jacobians. And I just realized that I put curves there and I'm going to be talking about Riemann surfaces, but it's, it's the same thing, complex curves or, or Riemann surfaces. So um, C is going to be a compact Riemann surface of genus G. Okay, um, uh, so it's going to be a bunch of uh, a, a connected sum or whatever of, of tori. Um, so the first homology group is uh, is of rank 2G. It's a free abelian group of, of rank 2G. Um, and it's generated by, for example, in, in the picture, you have a genus 3, and there are the alphas and the betas, um, and those are the generators of the homology group. Okay. Um, we also have that um, if you have the canonical line bundle, Okay, so I'm going to try to, um, here we're, we're kind of between two worlds. We're between the world of, uh, of, uh, of complex geometry and algebraic geometry. I'm a little more uh, on, the, on the algebraic side, but I'm, I try to uh, use uh, language that's kind of in between. So if, if you have the canonical line bundle, then we have that the global sections of this canonical line bundle is, um, it's of dimension G. And that's just uh, that space, H0 of, of, of omega, is just H10 of C. So it's the, it's the holomorphic differentials, um, basically. Okay, so on any compact Riemann surface of genus G, you have using uh, the Riemann-Roch theorem that that's of dimension G. Okay. And we have an inclusion. So we have the first homology group. We can see it included um, within the... the the space of holomorphic differentials of the dual of the space of holomorphic differentials where we take a basically a sum of curves gamma and we send it to the um, the linear functional that takes a, a differential form and sends it to the integral over the, the path over gamma okay so it's uh, it's not hard to prove that this is actually an inclusion and so then if we take uh, the quotient here um, we get a complex torus Okay, so to every curve, we can associate a complex torus um, of dimension G, which is called the Jacobian variety of C. Okay. Um, okay, these, these are all very uh, standard facts. Okay, um, and um, also, so if, if T is a complex torus of dimension G, a polarization on a torus is going to be, for us, for our... Um, for this talk, it's going to be a positive definite Hermitian form um, on, uh, on V that you can identify with the tangent space at zero of the torus. Um, and uh, so it's going to be a positive definite Hermitian form such that the imaginary part of H restricted to the lattice, lambda, is uh, going to take um, integer values. Okay? So... Um, in other words, if you're uh, more on the complex geometric side, in other words, um, a polarization for us is going to be an integral Kähler form. Okay, so um, in particular, polarization is going to imply that a complex torus is projective. So for us, an abelian variety is going to be a complex torus that has a polarization. It's going to be a projective torus. Okay, and we're going to call H a principal polarization if the imaginary part restricted to the lattice has determinant one, okay? Okay, so this is just uh, standard definitions. Okay, so we're gonna define um, the following. We're gonna find uh, the following moduli spaces, and here I'm not gonna be worried about uh, functors or anything. We're just gonna do it very, um, very naively, I guess. We're gonna take MG is gonna be the space of compact Riemann surfaces of genus G mod isomorphism and ag 
is going to be a set of principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension G. So basically that's going to be pairs um, A comma H, where A is an abelian variety, A is a torus, and H is a, polar, a principal polarization on A, okay, mod isomorphism. Okay, and both of these spaces that parameterize compact Riemann surfaces or principally polarized abelian varieties, um, both of these spaces uh, can be given the structure of quasi-projective varieties, okay? Um, or if we want to do things right, I guess we'd have to talk about stacks, okay? But uh, that's not the point of this talk for right now. Okay, and so the previous construction of taking a compact Riemann surface and associating to it this torus gives us a map from MG to AG, okay? Um, so it's, uh, uh, so it takes the curve, it gives uh, the Jacobian. Um, I haven't said how to get a principal polarization yet. Um, I guess, uh, I think that's coming in a second, okay? But, um, but the Torelli theorem uh, says the following, J is injective. So basically, if you start off with two Riemann surfaces, um, and their Jacobians are isomorphic, not just as toward, but also with the polarization, which I'm going to talk in one second about what the natural polarization is on the Jacobian varieties. Then you actually get that the two curves are isomorphic. Okay, so uh, this is a very nice theorem. Um, so basically, MG is included in AG. Um, you can see it as, as some kind of subvariety, um, not closed, okay, um, but um, it's included uh, inside. Okay, and um, so it's it's not hard to prove also that J is dominant for um, genus less than or equal to three. Okay, and um, so the dimensions of these spaces um, are, so the dimension of M0, genus zero Riemann surfaces, compact Riemann surfaces, there's only one, which is P1, so that's of dimension zero. Um, the dimension of M1, which I guess it really should be M11, um, is one that's the um, that's the moduli space of complex tori of dimension one, and for g greater than or equal to two, we have that uh, the dimension of mg is three g minus three. But on the other hand, the dimension of ag um, is uh, g over two, g times uh, yeah g times g plus one over two, I guess g times g plus one um, halves. Sorry, I think there's a mistake there. That should be g times g minus one halves. Um, okay, and um, so as you can see, the dimension of AG grows a lot faster than the dimension of MG, okay, which means that, so uh, for G greater than or equal to four, G equals four is the first uh, instance when these have different dimension, okay, so J can't be uh, dominant in that case, and so there are many more, in some sense, there are many more principally polarized abelian varieties than Jacobians. Okay, and so that leads us to the Schottky problem. Okay, so the Schottky problem basically asks what the closure of, uh, of the Jacobian locus is, or how, how to characterize Jacobians, okay, within the space of abelian varieties, principally polarized abelian varieties. Okay, so in other words, um, given a principally polarized abelian variety, how can we know if it is the Jacobian variety of some compact Riemann surface? Okay. Um, and um, this is a very, sorry, this is a, this is a very old problem. So Schottky um, was a mathematician from the 1800s. Okay. And this is, uh, I'm going to talk briefly in one line basically about what uh, Schottky did. Um, but so this is a problem that's been from the time of Riemann, I guess. Uh, Riemann also um, added uh, to this problem. Okay, so very simple question. This is the question that's driving this whole talk. So given a uh, principally polarized abelian variety, so basically a torus, a complex torus of dimension G with the polarization, how can we tell if it comes from a Riemann surface or not? Okay, so let me... Um, uh, say a few things about abelian varieties. So to every um, tau in the Siegel upper half space, which is just the set of matrices, complex matrices with imaginary part, um, positive definite um, and symmetric. Um, so we can associate a, a, a principally polarized abelian variety. Okay, so the torus is just gonna be C to the G mod 
um, a lattice, and the lattice is going to be the columns of M. Uh, oh, sorry, I put M. It's really tau. Um, the columns of tau plus um, the uh, the integer uh, vectors. And you can show that um, the the matrix given by the imaginary part of tau inverse um, that's going to give a positive definite um, Hermitian form um, that satisfies uh, what we need um, for it to be a polarization. So we have a principal polarization. Okay, and vice versa, you can prove it's not hard to prove that every principally polarized abelian variety is isomorphic to one as above. So you can find a matrix in the uh, Siegel upper half space. Um, such that the torus is isomorphic to that quotient, and the um, Hermitian form is um, is uh, is as it is right there with this with that same matrix. Okay, and um, this generalizes what happens with elliptic curves. So you can prove that a tau is isomorphic as principally polarized abelian variety. So it's not just as tor as a torus. Um, so it's isomorphic to a tau prime. If and only if there exists uh, a matrix A, B, C, D in the symplectic group. Okay, so for G equals one, this is just going to be the this is just going to be SL two. This is just going to be the, the special linear group, um, such that tau prime is equal to um, to that expression. Okay, so these are so the symplectic group acts um, as generalized Mobius transformations on the Siegel upper half space. Um, and um, this directly generalizes what happens with G equals one. Okay, and so AG, we can think of it as the Siegel upper half space mod the action of the symplectic group. Okay, and so one way to, to think about the Schottky problem is to ask what period matrices are, um, are period matrices of principally polarized abelian, uh, sorry, what period matrices of principally polarized abelian varieties are the period matrices of Jacobians. So these, so tau um, basically is, is a period matrix, okay? A matrix of periods, you can see it as, as certain integrals, um, which I'm not gonna go uh, further into, okay? But there are approaches, I'm not gonna talk about them today, but there are approaches to the Schottky problem that actually look at the period matrices and try to determine um, when, um, when they come from a Jacobian variety. Okay. Um, so this is uh, getting a little uh, more into the algebraic geometry side. So giving a principal polarization, so this integral Kähler form, if you wish, um, is equivalent to giving an ample divisor. Okay, so a divisor is just a, a co-dimension one subvariety, a sum of co-dimension one uh, subvarieties, closed subvarieties. Um, and we want for uh, H0 um, to be a, a dimension one. Okay, so a principal, uh, a principal polarization, we can think of it, of it as the Hermitian form, or we can also think of it as an ample divisor with um, mod multiplication by a scalar, one global section. Okay, um, and how do we uh, go from one to the other? Well, if we have such a divisor, um, then the first Schoen class of the line bundle associated to this divisor is, uh, can be seen as the Hermitian form. Okay, the, so the first Schoen class, you can think of it as an element of H2 of AC, for example. Um, and for a complex torus, um, uh, basically you can translate this into being a Hermitian form on the tangent space. Okay, so there's a nice translation in between. And um, such a divisor is unique up to translation. Okay, and... Um, so for a Riemann surface, I should have said this before when talking about a, uh, MG and AG, but for a Riemann surface, uh, the Jacobian variety is not just a torus, but also comes naturally equipped with, uh, with a theta divisor. Okay, um, and so what divisor is that? It is, uh, so we can consider the following function. We start with, a, with the Riemann surface C, and um, we have this morphism from C to its Jacobian. Uh, so remember that the Jacobian is holomorphic uh, one forms mod uh, integration basically okay mod uh, well, mod sorry mod uh, yeah integration over um, over over loops in the in the hom first homology group okay so we can take um, uh, we can take p sorry it's the dual of the one forms so we can take p and send it to if we fix q we take p and send it to the integral from q to p okay which is going to be 
uh, a function that takes a, a differential form and sends it to a complex number, and that's well defined up to um, basically you can choose different paths between Q and P. Okay, but if we choose two different paths, then mod H1 it's going to be the, give the exact same number. Okay, so um, mod H1 this is well defined. This is called the the Abel uh, Jacobi map. Okay, um, and we can define the following divisor. So we, uh, we basically have C living inside its Jacobian. Okay, you can prove actually that alpha Q is an embedding. Um, and actually the Jacobian actually is, uh, is, has a universal property, which is basically in some sense, it's the smallest abelian variety um, that C maps to. Okay, um, but we can define theta, we can define a, a divisor on, on the Jacobian as we just take the image of C and we add it G minus one times. Okay, and so that's going to give us a divisor. Um, it's a, the theta divisor. Um, and the first churn class of this, uh, of this theta divisor is going to be a Hermitian form. And you can actually look, you can see geometrically what the imaginary part is. So the imaginary part of the first churn class of this theta divisor is going to be um, the intersection product on the first homology group. Okay, so... Uh, I know there's quite a lot of information, but um, um, but it's very geometric. You can you can think you can uh, understand what the Hermitian form is in a very geometric way. Okay, none of this is going to be needed for for what's coming. Okay, so remember the Schottky problem is we have the Jacobian locus inside the locus of principally plurizabian varieties, and we want to determine when a principally plurizabian variety is a Jacobian. Okay, that's that's all. It's a very simple question. So I'd like to um, I'd like to go over different approaches that have existed to the Shaki problem, um, historically speaking, and then I want to show uh, I want to concentrate on one approach, which I find very beautiful, and it's and it's uh, the approach that's garnered quite a bit of attention um, the past couple of decades. Okay, so. First of all, starting with Riemann, uh, Schottky in the 1880s, um, Jung in the 1900s, Farkas and, and Rauch in the 1960s, Van Giemen, Dunagi in the 1980s, uh, even more recently, uh, Grushevsky, um, uh, among others. Um, they worked on taking AG um, and actually finding explicit equations. Okay, so AG, you can see it as a, um, as a quasi-projective variety via uh, modular forms, for example. Um, and so uh, I'm simplifying things a bit, but basically you want to find equations for the Jacobian locus um, using uh, modular forms. So basically, is there a modular form that is zero on the Jacobian locus and is, is non-zero outside it, basically? So if we, can, if we can cut out the Jacobian locus by explicit equations. Okay, and so... Uh, yeah. one, one question. You are considering Schottky problem purely in a period context, transcendence, but not the algebraic. For example, if I give you abelian variety, you decide whether uh, it is uh, Jacobian or not. Yes, that's the question. Given a, an abelian variety, if it's a Jacobian or not, yes. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that in the period level or in the purely algebraic level? Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about now is the purely algebraic level. Okay. Um, so the period level, um, let me just mention that really quick. The period level is, is uh, if, I'm, if I recall correctly, uh, the uh, the approach I've seen at the period level is basically um, I believe it's that Jacobians have periods that are smaller than regular abelian varieties uh, in some sense. Okay, so there's a so they're they're quite special. So, but I'm not going to go into that now. So right now I'm talking about more from an algebraic geometry perspective. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, and so um, these uh, mathematicians um, found uh, explicit equations. Um, for example, Schottky described, um, he, he found an equation um, in genus four. So remember that genus four is the first um, instance where the Jacobian locus is not dominant, is not dense in, the, in AG. And uh, Schottky found a, an equation um, that uh, that uh, is satisfied for uh, Jacobian varieties. Um, and it was later proved that that was basically the, um, uh, his equation describes completely Jacobian varieties in genus four, okay? But this approach is still uh, quite open um, for G greater than or equal to five, 
um, to actually find explicit equations. Um, so equations have been found, but so far um, they've been able to prove that the Jacobian locus is an irreducible component of the, of the zeros of the equations found. Okay, so, um, which is pretty good, but it's a, it's, a, it's a weaker problem. It's a weaker solution to this problem. Okay, and so it's completely solved for genus four. Um, another very beautiful approach, and all these approaches, I'm not doing justice to, to each of these approaches. For each of these approaches, you could do probably a, a semester course in these, in, in, let alone a, do a complete talk for each of these. So I'm just, I'm giving a very, very brief summary of each of these. Um, so in the 60s, Andriotti and, and, and Meyer um, showed that the Jacobian locus is an irreducible component of the, the space of principally polarized abelian varieties, um, such that the singular locus of the theta divisor is greater than or equal to g minus four. So you can prove that the, a Jacobian variety, if it's if the Riemann surface is not hyperliptic, then the singular locus of the theta divisor is of dimension g minus four. Um, and if it's hyperliptic, then the singular locus is of dimension g minus three. Okay, so you can prove that these this space n g minus four comma g is, you can prove it's a, it's a sub-variety of, of a g, um, and, um, and uh, you can, and it was proven that the Jacobian locus is an irreducible component of that, but it, once again, there are other possible components, okay? So it's, again, a weak solution. Um, so in, uh, so in the 50s and, and then in the 80s, Matsusaka and Ron, um, uh, basically, Matsusaka started this. I, I believe he's, he was studying endomorphisms of Jacobians. Then Ron put it into this perspective. I think um, that uh, a comma theta is in the Jacobian locus if and only if basically this cohomology class theta intersected with itself g minus one times. So you divide by g minus one factorial if it's represented by an integral curve. Uh, so, but if there's a curve that um, that has that class, okay. Um, so the uh, this is, uh, in some sense, a complete solution, but it's a very abstract solution. And how do you check that in practice? Okay, so it's 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 actually it's very um, uh, this is a very useful theorem um, in some contexts. But if I give you a, a principally polarized abelian variety, how are you going to check inside that class if there's a um, if there's a curve or not? Um, so anyone who's who knows anything about Hodge theory knows that. Uh, looking at uh, these classes are, are very complicated. Okay? Um, so this is a solution, but in practice, uh, it's, it's quite hard to check. Okay, let's look at another one. This is a, a more modern one. So if we have a, an indecomposable principally polarized abelian variety, which just means that theta is irreducible, um, we have the Gauss map of theta. Okay, so what's the Gauss map? The Gauss map, there are several ways to look at it. One is, if you want to look at it from an algebraic geometry point of view, it's just the rational map given by this complete linear system. So you take theta, you restrict it to theta, um, so it's a, it's a line bundle, um, and you take the complete linear system, that gives us a, a map to P, G minus one. Okay, um, Another way is if you take a section, um, so remember that the theta divisor has one section, mod multiplication by scalar. So if you take uh, a generator of the sections, then the Gauss map is just take all the partial derivatives, okay, um, and, and put them as a, as a projective tuple. Um, another way is, is a very geometric way. You take a point P, a smooth point of theta, you take the, the hyperplane, uh, you take the tangent plane that goes through P, the tangent plane to theta, um, and then you translate that to the origin, and that gives you a hyperplane in the uh, tangent plane, uh, uh, in the tangent space of A. Um, and so the tangent, that, that gives you an element of the tangent space of A uh, dual, basically. And that's another geometric way of seeing it. Okay? But it's not too important. Um, and you can prove there's a very beautiful description of the Gauss map. Um, of a theta divisor for, uh, for curves, for Jacobians. Um, and so um, you can prove that it's always, G is always generically finite. So there's a, um, um, so mod um, some bad sublocus, uh, it's gonna be finite. 
Um, and for Jacobians, it's always finite, actually. Okay, so there, there aren't any positive dimensional fibers. Um, and it's uh, the degree, for a non-hyperliptic Jacobians, the degree is 2G minus 2 over G minus 1. And for hyperliptic Jacobians, it's 2 to the G minus 1. So there's a very beautiful description of this in terms of the, uh, the canonical map uh, for our Riemann surface. Okay, and so um, Kodoni, uh, Grushevsky, and Sernesi, uh, they conjectured in 2017, in an article they have, where they studied the Gauss map. Um, and then finally, Kodoni and, and, and Kramer, Kramer uh, proved that um, the Jacobian locus is an irreducible component of all principally polarized abelian varieties, where the degree of the Gauss map is less than or equal to 2G minus 2 over G minus 1. Okay. So again, a nice solution, very different from the other solutions, but again, it's a weak solution in the sense that we have uh, possibly more components, okay? Um, so as you can see where uh, this problem has been attacked from, from very different points of view, and I'm gonna show a, an even different one. I'm, we're talking about differential equations in a minute. Um, so, oh, here we go, okay, differential equations. I'm gonna get back to the Gauss map in a minute. Um, so uh, in a very different uh, area, we have this, the KP equation, okay? So it's this differential equation. Um, and basically it was known that in some sense, the theta, uh, the theta function, the theta function is just a section of the theta divisor. Um, in some sense, the theta function satisfies uh, the KP equation if it comes from a Riemann surface. Okay, a compact Riemann surface. Um, and so uh, Novikov, sorry, I, I misspelled his name there. Novikov uh, conjectured in the 70s, um, he conjectured the following. So an irreducible principally polarized abelian variety is the Jacobian of a compact Riemann surface if and only if there exist u, v, and w, uh, so complex vectors with u different from zero such that this function u satisfies the KP equation. Okay, um, and this was proved in 1986 by Shioda. So this is actually a theorem now. This is a complete solution to the to the Schottky problem. This is an analytic solution. So this is there's a, there's a way to I'm going to talk about this in a second. How to um, how to look in the, look at this in an algebraic perspective, but the proof here is completely analytic. Okay, so. Um, so as you can see, now I can really say that the, the Schottky problem has been attacked from very different points of view. So we have complex geometry, we have uh, differential equations, we have algebraic geometry and different flavors of algebraic geometry. So it's, this is one of the reasons why I like this problem because uh, students, um, students can get into it uh, and uh, even if they have very different um, interests, um, there's, there's a place for, for all kinds of interests in this problem in this area okay um uh, just to be sure uh, theta has two arguments one is related to period the other one the coordinate on the abelian variety this x u plus y v is the coordinate on the abelian variety no the, the so okay so the, right in the equation here yeah yeah in inside theta yeah so okay so yeah so z basically is the okay so yeah so um so is this inside the abelian variety you're saying yeah, this is the this is the, if I look the theta as a function of z and tau, z coordinate on the abelian uh -huh. variety and tau on the Ziegel domain. Uh -huh. So you, you have not written the, the, the coordinate on the Ziegel domain. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, I, I left that off. Yes, exactly. Yes. So I'm uh, I'm just uh, so the coordinate is is basically implicit since I'm saying that theta is uh, a section of of this right here, and implicit in this is the coordinate of the Ziegel domain. Yes, exactly. So yeah, so there's a that's a, there's a very explicit way um, for those who don't know. There's a very explicit way to write these theta functions in terms of the Ziegel upper half space, um, and and you can have a, an explicit uh, expression as a you can take the Fourier series basically, and um, so that's another an, another way um, to look at it. Okay, so. Um, Regarding the KP equation, so it was already known since the 1970s. This is work by Novikov, Kurchever, Dubrovin, and, and among others, that, um, that the theta functions of a compact Riemann surface do satisfy the KP equation um, in this sense. 
Okay, so this is the theorem. This is a complete solution to the Schottky problem, um, um, but it's analytic in, in nature. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, personally my favorite approach, which is via the Coomer variety. Okay, um, so we're going to start with an indecomposable principally polarized abelian variety, which again is just a complex torus. Theta is a, an ample divisor with one global section, mod uh, multiplication by a scalar. And indecomposable is just that theta is irreducible. Okay, so the Coomer variety of A is the quotient of a by um, z you send it to minus z okay so um this is um it's a it's a singular uh, variety it's um uh, the singular points um come from the two torsion points of a okay now the nice thing is that um so you can prove using a, a riemann rock for abelian varieties that the dimension of the global sections of two theta is two to the g, okay? And um, and if we take the the map associated to the linear system two theta, so this gives us a morphism from a to uh, p to the two to the g minus one, and you can prove that it's actually two to one. It's no, not two to one. It's uh, it's the image is isomorphic to the Coomer variety, okay? So this this map factors through the Coomer variety, okay? So in some sense, if we fix theta then we have a canonical embedding um, from uh, the Coomer variety into projective space, albeit the, 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 the dimension of the projective space is huge, uh, 2 to the g minus 1, and in, in the Coomer variety is dimension g. Okay, but it's a canonical embedding um, uh, given theta. Okay, so we're, and for, from now on, I'm going to always be talking about the Coomer variety canonically embedded in um, projective space. Okay, so there's um, this is a classic formula. We have the addition formula um, for a uh, theta function, um, which basically says that we have a basis for the sections of two theta, such that we have this formula right here. We can we can uh, relate um, basically theta uh, with uh, with the sections of two theta. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into this, but I'm going to show why it's used um, and what follows. Okay, so in the 70s um, and also 80s with Gunning, so we have Faye and Gunning, um, they proved that if you have a compact Riemann surface and you have four points on the Riemann surface, then we have the following inclusion. Okay, so uh, it's a scheme, theoretic, scheme theoretic inclusion. Um, but um, so we have that theta intersected with a certain translate of theta. So re remember that that alpha Q was just a, a map from the Riemann surface to the Jacobian. It was in, an embedding um, of the Riemann surface into its Jacobian. Okay, so this is just a point on the Jacobian um, determined by these two points here on the curve on the Riemann surface. Okay, and T is translation. So if we intersect theta with a certain translate of theta, then this is it's going to be reducible um, and it's contained in the union of two translates of theta okay so this doesn't look that interesting um, but it is uh, when you realize the following um, so using the addition formula so we have here um, so the the ideal of this union is going to be um, it's going to be a product of two translated theta functions basically Okay, and so using the addition formula, we can translate um, we can translate this uh, inclusion here into a fact about um, into a statement about uh, theta functions using uh, into uh, in, sorry into a statement about second order theta functions um, using this right here. And once we translate this fact into second order theta functions like this then what it gives us is it gives us that the points, um, so these points right here, um, so these, these three points, they look kind of ugly, but they're three points on the Jacobian variety. If you look at their images in the Coomer variety, so the Coomer, the Coomer variety, remember that this map given by two theta gives the embedding uh, of, the, of the Coomer variety, and it's just putting the sections of, of two theta all in a, in a tuple. Okay, so once you translate this using the addition formula, 
you get that these three points are collinear. Okay, so there, there's a there's a line going through them, um, and it's 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 not hard to get from here to the collinearity of these three points. Okay, it's not quite obvious why these three points are going to be collinear given given this uh, this inclusion, but you just have to do a little bit of work, and it, it's not that bad. Okay, so you get um, um, three points that are collinear. So you have a trisecant. Okay, um, and so why is this interesting? Well, once you think about it, uh, the, the Coomer variety is, is a dimension G in a projective space of very large dimension. You really wouldn't think that there are trisecants. It seems like uh, those are quite special points. Okay, um, and actually if we move, so this is given P, Q, R, and S on the Riemann surface, we get these uh, three points that are collinear. If we move P, Q, R, and S, then we get actually a four-dimensional family of trisecant lines. Okay, so we get a bunch of points that um, that are on a trisecant line. Okay, and and so um, Gunning and, and Welters, they, they realize that this is actually quite a special property of Jacobians. Um, and so uh, they prove the following. So if you take, um, let's say that there exists ABC on A, um, such that, so we take all the zetas on A such that um, the image of zeta plus A, zeta plus B, zeta plus C are collinear. Okay, um, so uh, for example, if A, B, and C are collinear on the Kuma variety, then zero is in gamma. So if, if the dimension of that, um, of, of this subscheme uh, is, is positive, greater than zero, then you have that A comma theta is the Jacobian of a compact Riemann surface. Okay, so this, uh, this is a solution to the Schottky problem. And actually, the way that you recover the curve is that two times gamma, so the image of, of gamma, the multiplication by two, is actually the, the Riemann surface. Okay, um, so it's, it's a very, uh, uh, very beautiful proof. So Gunning did it in a, in a complex geometric way. And Velters did it in a scheme theoretic way. He, uh, Velters actually showed that if you have, um, he, he generalized this a little bit more, even if you have A, B, and C um, uh, not necessarily different. So if you have basically a scheme, uh, uh, if you have a line that interse intersects uh, scheme theoretically, the Kumo variety in a, along an Artinian uh, subscheme of length three. So that's a, a fancy way of saying a, a, maybe a digenerate trisecant, for example. Then you still get if you have a one-dimensional family of these at least, then you get um, you get uh, a Jacobian. Okay. And so uh, Welters uh, he he uh, made this bold conjecture. He said uh, he thought it was so special, such a special property of Jacobians. So he, he conjectured that if K if the Kummer variety has one trisecant, then it's the Jacobian of a curve. Okay. Okay, so that's the that's the conjecture that we're going to be looking at. If there's one trisecant, is it true that we actually have a Jacobian? Okay, and we're going to come back to this in, in one second. I want to explain um, just briefly connection between the KP equation and trisecants, because this is, everything's connected here. It's very beautiful how, how differential equations um, uh, interacts with geometry here. Okay, um, so... We had that if, uh, if we have a compact Riemann surface, then we have uh, a trisecant. Um, and we can move A, B, and C around because we have this four-dimensional family, basically, that depend on points of the, of the Riemann surface. Um, and so basically what that's saying is that we have an equation of this sort. So remember that theta, J, are the, these, are the, the, these are the coordinates of the Coomer map, basically, the, this map of two theta, whose image is the Coomer variety. And so if we take this equation and we... Um, this was observed by Mumford in his famous article, Curves and the Jacobians. So if we move A, B, and C together, then all of a sudden we get the KP equation, mod maybe a couple of uh, changes of variable and stuff like that. But basically what we get when we bring A, B, and C together, we get the KP equation. So basically what the KP equation is telling us is that um, if the KP equation is satisfied, then we get a, a third order germ of inflectionary tangent lines. So basically there's going to be, there's going to be uh, this germ of, 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 uh, of tangent lines that uh, um, uh, trisecant lines, basically they're tangent of the Coomer variety. 
Okay, so the Kumar variety, so the, the KP equation is very related to this geometric observation that Riemann, the Kumar variety of, uh, of Jacobians have tricyclic lines. Okay, and I just want to give one more, this is where my work comes in, then I'm going to stop talking about my work. Um, one uh, interesting uh, theorem that we proved um, a couple years ago with the Codonian and Salvati Mani um, is that, so if you have a, a principally polarizability variety and you have um, X and Y points on the theta divisor that also lie on, the, on a trisecant, which these points exist, you can prove it's, a, it's, it's basically a dimension count. Then uh, points that are on the same trisecant are collapsed to the same point uh, by the Gauss map, which is kind of a curiosity. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, and also we gave a, a stratification of the branch locus of the Gauss map, which recall the, the Gauss map was also used to attack the Schottky problem. By, uh, it was conjectured that if you look at all the principally polarizability varieties, um, where the degree of the Gauss map is less than or equal to 2g minus 2 over g minus 1, then you have a Jacobian. Um, and and it's, a, it's a weak solution to the, to the Schottky problem. Okay, but so we, we provided a stratification of the branch locus of the Gauss map um, such that, um, so in this case, if you have the x and y are on a trisecant, then um, they have the same image via the Gauss map and they belong to this bg minus 3. And vice versa, if you take a generic point of B, G minus 3, and you look at all the points um, uh, on the fiber over this generic point, then if you look at the highest multiplicity of the fiber, then you're going to get that those points lie on a trisecant. Okay, so it's kind of a curious way. Uh, there's still uh, several open questions here, which we're not quite sure about, but it's kind of an interesting uh, interaction between the Gauss map and trisecants. Okay, so all these different approaches touch on each other somehow. So we have the Gauss map, we have trisecants, we have the KP equation, um, among other approaches. Okay, and so in some sense, this is uh, interesting because it gives us a way to, because uh, if, if we're talking about the trisecant conjecture, which Belters gave, if you have one trisecant, then it's a Jacobian. Okay, that's nice, but how do you go about looking for trisecants? Well, in some sense, uh, this uh, this helps a little bit. If you look at the the branch locus and if you look at points of, of a certain multiplicity, then you can kind of know where to look for trisecants. Okay, it's really not that helpful in practice, I think, but, uh, but it, it makes it a little bit more precise uh, where we can look. Okay, I'm going to start stop talking about the Gauss map. Okay, so now let's, um, in, in what follows, um, for the, the last part of the talk, I just want to concentrate on, on Welter's conjecture. Okay, so if the Kumar variety has one trisecant, so a trisecant, a trisecant, for me, a trisecant is a trisecant line. It's a line that intersects the Kumar variety in at least three points. Okay, um, so early progress was made um, in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, Arbarello, De Contini, De Bar, um, and Marini. Um, they all have different articles on this. And in all their articles, they have the following. Um, they have the following. Basically, they, they prove that if you, if you have a, a, some kind of degenerate trisecant, basically a trisecant that, um, that uh, intersects, uh, that's, that's tangent to the Kumar variety, and if you ask for some other geometric condition, then you get a Jacobi. Okay, so the way they were able to do this with was, uh, so you take the, the trisecant, you, you ask for this other condition, then you're able to uh, form a family of trisecants and then use Belter and Gunning's result, which is basically if you have a, a family, then you're able to reconstruct the curve. Okay, so this is quite a good solution to, to Belter's um, conjecture. But what's bothering here is this right here. You know, I mean, this is an elegant conjecture right here. It's very nice. And you'd like to say, if you have one trisecant, then you have a Jacobian. Okay, so you don't, you don't want to be adding these relatively minor conditions. Uh, it, it just doesn't look as nice. And so the, the conjecture was still open. Okay, um, 
However, in 2010, and actually probably maybe a little bit before, but it was published in Annals of Mathematics in 2010, um, uh, Krichever uh, proved the trisecant conjecture. Okay, so if the Kummer variety of an indecomposable principle of polarized abelian variety admits any kind of trisecant, trisecant, so we're talking about a flex, which is basically it's uh, a, uh, a line that intersects the Kummer variety in one point, but it's uh, um, in that point, it's uh, the intersection gives a subscheme, an Artinian subscheme of length three, a degenerate trisecant, which is basically a line that intersects in two points and it's tangent in one, or a bona fide trisecant, which is basically it intersects in three points. Um, so then, um, then you get a Jacobian. Okay, so the uh, this was proved. Now. Um, the methods used by Kucheva are analytic uh, methods. There, he uses uh, differential equations, uses, uh, I believe, integrable systems, um, methods that I'm not familiarized with at all. Um, and it's a very difficult uh, article. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but basically, it's the, the fact is true, over the complex numbers at least, it is true that, um, that the existence of a trisecant implies that you have a a Jacobian. Okay. Um, let me say real quick that here, the progress made by Arbarello, De Concini, Debar, and, and Marini, these were all uh, algebraic, um, algebraic approaches. Okay. They're all the proofs that they gave were algebraic. Okay. But um, Krukever's proof is analytic. Okay. Um, so up until 2000, uh, so I guess uh, up until recently, there wasn't any algebraic proof of this fact. Okay, so um, there have been some recent developments, and recent I'm talking about last year. Okay, um, so recently, in 2021, Arbarello, Codoni, and Pareschi um, basically proved the trisecant conjecture almost in its full degree, and they gave an algebraic proof of it. Okay, they, this was published, um, I believe, in Crele's journal. Okay, so if the Kummer variety of an indecomposable principally polarized abelian variety has a degenerate trisecant or a flex, so basically anything but uh, a tri, uh, trisecant that goes through three points, then you have a Jacobian. Okay, so they, it, it's an, an algebraic geometry proof of the same fact, but there's still the bona fide trisecant uh, uh, that's still open. In that case is still open. Okay, so that's uh, an algebraic proof is still, it still does not exist. Okay, um, and so what's, how were they able to, to, to do this? Well, so they used the previous ideas from Arbarello, De Bar, De Contini, and Marini. Um, and so every time, so Arbarello, so all, all these uh, mathematicians, they always ran into some kind of obstruction to be able to obtain a, a one-dimensional famine. That's where the extra, condi uh, extra conditions come in. Okay, so um, what Arbarello, Codoni, and Pareschi did was they, they defined the following. So if you take a, a closed algebraic subgroup of A, you define sigma of A theta G to be the maximal G invariant subscheme of theta. Okay, so this has a, a natural uh, subscheme, well, it's defined as, as a, a subscheme. And so they use this. Um, their main technical result, basically, in their article is that these are reduced. And um, they, along the way, they prove that the base locus of, um, of a line bundle on, a, on an abelian variety, the base locus is reduced. Okay, And then they prove that so that these, these uh, sigmas are reduced. Okay, um, and so basically the extra conditions um, that were needed by Arbarello, De Bar, De Contini, Marini, um, basically had to do with, uh, I'm simplifying here, I'm oversimplifying, but in one of the cases, you had a section of a certain line bundle, and you needed, and you had that the square of that section is zero on a certain subscheme. And what you really needed was for that section to be zero. And with that, you're able to prove the, you're able to extend and, and improve the trisecant conjecture. Okay, so you have that the square of something is zero and that and that that something you want it to be zero. 
And so using this, these sigmas, um, Abarelo, um, Codoni, and Pareschi were able to, um, to bypass the other conditions that were needed. And we're able to prove that using the fact that these sigmas are reduced, then you can um, get around the other problems that these other mathematicians had. Okay, and so they were, able to, they were able to prove it that way. So this is the main, the main technical lemma of their paper is that these sigmas are reduced. And then as an application, you get the trisecan conjecture, basically. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, and so this is still kind of mysterious. Uh, this is uh, something that I've been looking at um, and uh, thinking about. So for the true trisecan uh, case, so if the existence of one trisecan that goes through actually three points, if that implies that um, you get a Jacobian, um, this... Uh, Apparently the sigmas, I think they're, um, I think there are examples where the sigmas are too big. I think if you have that the, the co-dimension is big enough of these sigmas, then you're okay. But I think there are examples where these sigmas behave quite badly. I think they're quite large. And so I think, I believe uh, maybe someone, uh, maybe if someone knows better than I do, they could correct me. But, um, but there's a problem uh, with the bona fide tri-seeking case. Okay. And so now to end this talk, that's, uh, this is ongoing research. This is things that I've been thinking about, um, which these sigmas that um, Codoni, uh, Alvarello, Pareschi um, studied, um, we need to understand these better. Okay, so um, again, I wasn't included in, in their article, but these things that, that interest me and uh, have interested me for, for quite some time. Um, so um, what's needed to, to continue to a proof of the, the actual tri-seeking conjecture, in my opinion, is to understand these sigmas better, calculate them in explicit examples, um, look at the sigma that appears in the bona fide tri-seeking case and see if there's a way to understand that better and, and get around the, the actual, the, the obstruction that, that exists now. And also understand uh, how these appear in higher sequency conditions. So um, one interesting thing that I didn't say is that, um, so you have the Jacobian locus and the locus of principally polarized abelian varieties, but the other low side that are very interesting. For example, you have prim varieties. Um, and so prim varieties, you can prove that the, the, the Kuma varieties of prim varieties have a family of quadrisecant planes. Okay, so you have Jacobian varieties that have a, a family of trisecant lines. Prims have a, a family of quadrisecant planes. Uh, there's kind of a, you, you wonder what the natural induction is. Uh, from then on, what, what other loci um, can be studied? Um, and so that's a problem that Debar actually uh, studied in the 90s and or maybe 80s, uh, I guess 80s, and uh, very little progress has been made on, on that, how, how to, high, what higher sequency conditions imply. Um, but uh, it seems that these sigmas still appear in if you want to study higher sequency conditions. So for example, given a, a quadrisecant plane, um, of the Kuma variety. Does that imply that there exists a one-dimensional family of quadrisecant planes? Um, these are all questions that, that can be asked. Um, also, uh, ask how these, these sigmas can be related to, uh, to base loci, sorry, base, I spelled it with, with a C, base loci of line bundles on the BN varieties. Okay, so these are, these are questions for ongoing research. But in conclusion, I hope that you see it's just a very fun problem to work on. It's been a very old problem, very classic problem. Um, it's been attacked uh, by many different points of view. Um, so there's actually a whole, a whole analytic side to it, not just Kruchever, but there, there's actually, I think there's a book out about uh, the KP equation and theta functions. And um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the the, the necessary language to, to be able to understand it well. Maybe someday I'll, I'll be able to do that. But, um, but it's just a very fun and beautiful geometric problem. So thanks for your attention. I hope uh, it was interesting to you. Mm. I will ask a question uh, when we stop recording. I already stopped. Just a moment.